Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're joining us from, uh, what position you hold, uh, what institution you might be uh, affiliated with. Uh, this is all great information to help us kind of and our presenters cater their presentation uh, to your needs. So please uh, give us whatever details you would like. Um, as well, if you could take, uh, make sure you mute your microphone if you're not speaking, just so we avoid any uh, feedback. Uh, so please use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen uh, to enter any uh, questions that you have as they come to you throughout the presentation. We will return to those questions during the Q&A portion. We'll have about 20 minutes or so for that at the end. Uh, and so we will definitely return to them and we'll use them to moderate the discussions. And we'll also give you an opportunity uh, during the Q&A to open your mic and ask questions that way if, if you prefer. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted on our eCampus Ontario Adaptive Learning web page and YouTube channels as a resource uh, for the future. Uh, so before I fully get jump into things, I just want to take a moment to honor and acknowledge uh, that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I recognize and am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First Peoples of this land. I'm joining you today from Fort Francis, Ontario, which is situated in the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Métis people, where it is my great privilege to live, work, and learn. In this virtual space, we are all convening from different places, and this is one of the things that makes the online environment special. I invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. So hello everyone and welcome to eCampus Ontario's webinar on adaptive learning toward assessment of adaptive teaching and learning tools, what matters. My name is Don Eldridge. I'm the digital learning associate on the programs and services team at eCampus Ontario, where I work primarily on the adaptive learning portfolio. It gives me great pleasure to be moderating today's webinar and to introduce our main presenters. Joining us are Dr. Banafshe Karmafar, who is a Senior Analyst, Strategic Research and Impact Evaluation in Higher Education for the Office of the Vice Provost, Academic Affairs and Teaching and Learning Support Services at the University of Ottawa. She leads research and assessment projects on digital cultures at the post-secondary level, the responsible selection of emerging technologies for post-secondary education, the implementation process of new techno technology initiatives, and the impact of the use of emerging technology by faculty, students, and teaching assistants. For over 10 years, Banif Shea has been a professor in critical discourse analysis, linguistics, second language education, and integration of technology and education in various post-secondary programs. She currently leads a project for creating assessment toolkits for AI-enhanced adaptive learning systems at the University of Ottawa. Also joining us is Dr. Edmund Zahideh, uh, who is the Lead Analyst Curriculum and Learning Outcomes at the University of Ottawa, working for the Office of the Vice Provost Academic Affairs, the Teaching and Learning Support Service, and the Program Evaluation Office, with over 25 years of experience in higher education and accreditation processes, and as a former professor and researcher in electrical engineering in Canada and overseas, Edmund provides support for the creation, modification, and evaluation of programs in the cyclical evaluation framework mandated by the Ontario University's Council on Quality Assurance. Edmund is passionate about finding innovative, high-impact educational models while contributing to the development of best practices using emerging technological platforms. So welcome to you both, and thank you very much for joining us here today. So before I turn it over to our presenters, I'd like to provide a little bit of context. Uh, adaptive learning platforms are educational technologies that assess a learner's knowledge, identify skills gaps, and provide personalized instructional paths towards learning outcomes. Overlapping with adaptive learning are other technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, and intelligent tutoring systems. Often experiential in nature, these technologies are grounded in competency-based instruction and move the learner towards mastery through ongoing practice and immediate feedback. 
Among the many benefits of adaptive learning, these technologies have been shown to improve learning efficiency, knowledge transfer, and learner engagement. eCampus Ontario has been working in the adaptive learning space for the past several years, where we see these technologies as an important and emerging part of the digital transformation of higher education. This year, we've been offering webinars that feature different types of adaptive learning technologies deployed at Ontario post-secondary institutions in a variety of different contexts. We are now turning our attention from specific types of adaptive learning technologies to considering how you select, implement, and evaluate adaptive learning technologies for your practice or institution. Dr. Karamafar and Dr. Zahidi from the University of Ottawa will lead us in this discussion in a three-part webinar series. Today, in part one, we will be examining the question, what are the key functions that stakeholders expect from an adaptive teaching and learning system? I'm now gonna stop sharing and hand things over to our presenters to take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Hello, everyone. Thanks uh, for being uh, here. What we are presenting today is the first presentation of three presentations, which are part of a project entitled Toward Assessment of Adaptive Teaching and Learning Tool in Higher Education, What Matters? We are working on this project at the Strategic Research Unit of Teaching and Learning Support Service, University of Ottawa, at the request of the Office of Vice Provost Academic Affairs. The project aims ultimately to suggest an evaluation toolkit for AI powered adaptive learning systems for the University of Ottawa. Next slide, please. So in the agenda today, we start with a quick overview of the three presentations, then we go through presentation one, and then we'll have a feedback activity, questions and answer times, and finally, what's next? Next slide, please. Thank you. So the purpose of this uh, series of three presentations in, in eCampus Ontario is to share with the educational community the results of our work and invite institutions to think together about criteria on how adaptive teaching and learning systems could be assessed in higher education. Uh, because of the time constraints, we uh, split our presentation into three parts, but each session builds on the previous sessions to provide a holistic view on selecting and assessing, assessing adaptive learning systems. I'll do a quick overview of these uh, three presentations here. Today, in, in this first presentation, we present what stakeholders could expect from an adaptive teaching and, and learning systems, what are the main functions that system can have, we will review the rationale and the objective. We will suggest eight functions of an AI augmented adaptive teaching and learning system for meeting the current and future needs of higher education. Uh, please note that today, even we consider some social and ethical impacts of each function, we don't fully discuss them today. In presentation two, entitled What Knowledge, Pedagogy, and Learner Models Do We Expect Adaptive Teaching and Learning Systems to Implement? One of our major topics will be the criteria for socially and ethically acceptable artificial intelligence in education. And the third presentation is about um, an evaluation toolkit. What are the key criteria to be considered when selecting an adaptive teaching and learning system? And next slide, please. So the title of our today's presentation, what are the key function expected by a stakeholder in, ad in an adaptive teaching and learning system? Next slide, please. So, why our first presentation is about expectations. Why is it necessary to do this, exer this exercise together and to know key functions that the stakeholders expect from an adaptive teaching and learning system? The first system, the first reason is uh, po post-secondary institutions need. Our society and very soon our academic institutions are immersed in new digital environments but the effects are not yet fully known, and we are only at the first steps of experimentations. So what will happen in the following steps is still largely in our hands. So it would be great if we were proactive. 
The second reason is that we have design responsibility. We accept technologies such as an adaptive learning system, and especially artificial intelligence could be useful for post-secondary education, but we must take care that their introduction is not driven by technology or by system designers. It should be also driven by the needs of the human beings, by needs of the post-secondary institutions, professors, the students, and TAs. So it would be great if the universities find and suggest the principles which can guide the system designers to develop an appropriate adaptive teaching and learning system which meet our needs. And finally, in previous uh, sessions in eCampus Ontario, we saw some very interesting case studies. So we thought that now it would be interesting to have a more holistic approach to what we as post-secondary institutions like that adaptive learning systems does for us. I turn over to Edmund. Thank you, Ben Afshi. Uh, so uh, talking about my main stakeholders, uh, of course, uh, our students are uh, part of the main st stakeholders, but not only students. We are thinking about professors, instructors uh, called in this presentation, and also as well as the institutions that are part of the public domain or private domain, if you like. We'd like to concentrate on their expectations. So we put ourselves in their shoes and uh, we thought about this and we said that, okay, what is that we want to do? We would like to reach and engage absolutely all learners, especially silent one, especially those who are difficult to reach in a large class, a large amphitheater of 400 students. Uh, we would like also to ensure alignments of the elements of the curriculum between themselves and uh, the course with the curriculum and vice versa. So everything should be aligned, should be uh, efficiently uh, working together. And last but not least, we also aim at offloading as much as possible mind-numbing, boring, time-consuming, manual administrative tasks that are imposed to the instructor during a course. Having been ourselves, and uh, uh, Manafshe is still uh, in the uh, teaching area, uh, we know how much this costs to the instructor in terms of uh, wastage of time. The scope of this presentation is more uh, on the key functions. Uh, so we came up with eight key functions that we think stakeholders would expect from such an adaptive teaching and learning system. What is outside the scope of this presentation is what is the technology that could do this? So we are expecting technologies, system designers, software developers to uh, come up with uh, our, our wishes and the platforms. We're not going to talk about these issues and we are not linked to absolutely to any company or product. So our approach is uh, to look at if we could implement a real-time measurement of the student learning, which is important to uh, make sure that all the academic programming that we are doing is in line with the uh, benefit, benefits of the public. Uh, so in that sense, we also are advo advocating the use of academic programming assessment. Uh, we aim at overcoming the multiple barriers to transforming administrative practices and planning within institutions. And we know there are lots and uh, many of them. Uh, one thing is uh, we have tried to be as modular as possible because we're offering the options to uh, stakeholders to use or to not to use the function. So we try to be as modular as possible. We, we could think of this activity as a need analysis, basically. Uh, the sky is the limit. We aim at dreaming big and let technology achieve our dreams instead of, as Ben Afshe mentioned it, being driven by technology. Of course, we have tried to stay away from fiction. Uh, we are holding ongoing consultations. Well, besides the consultation that we are going to, uh, hold, to hold with you today at the end of the uh, presentation, uh, of course, the literature, which is fantastic in this domain, the AI specialists at Ottawa, the pedagogy specialists at the TLSS at Ottawa, and experienced professors have been, are, and will be consulted on this project. Uh, so, 
Of course, we are talking about eight functions. We mentioned that. Uh, after our presentation, once it's done, uh, we would like to have a, another round of consultation with all of you as experts in the field of higher education. And these are the questions that we will uh, kindly request you to address. We are presenting these questions so that uh, during the uh, presentation, you, you have some time to reflect on it. So with this, just before going to the functions, uh, allow me uh, very quickly to review the assumptions that we have made. Uh, so first of all, we, are, we have assumed in the design of these functions that the course plan aligned with the PLOs with the program learning outcomes does exist. So the course learning outcomes have been defined in the course plan and these course learning outcomes are supposed to be aligned with the PLOs. Uh, UDL principles are fully respected. So whenever we mention generating new assessments, generating new ways of content delivery, getting content, etc., all of these is aligned with UDL principles. And the choice of the functions are are, is completely optional, which means each function that will be presented can be used by stakeholders if they want, if they wish to do so. There is by no way we do not intend to impose the use of uh, any of these functions. Uh, and these functions are flexible enough to uh, accommodate in-person, online, and hybrid formats. You are going to see two icons. Uh, one is reserved uh, for personalized feedback. So when you see this icon, this means that this is personalized feedback, marking and remediation. And the, the other one is means personalized feedback. So I'm trying to go to the next uh, slide now. Give me a second. My system is a bit slow, I, I think, because of the Zoom. Yes, we are here. Okay, we are here. So that's our universe. That's the academic institutions, our stakeholders are here. And we are going to talk about the first function, which is validation and curation. We put this function as the first function because it is extremely important to understand the position of these functions. So let me zoom on this one. So here, the objective is to ensure absolutely that all content and interactions with human actors like students, TAs, etc., are entirely consistent with the academic ecosystem in terms of policies, in terms of best practices, in terms of ETIs, etc. In other words, we want to give the instructor as the ultimate person responsible in the course, full control over the content and full vetting powers. So as you can see, we have seven other functions. So that's our first, first, first one. So any interaction that is initiated by the system and the students or the system and the teaching assistants has to be validated by the instructor. That's the major role of the validation. And uh, when we are going to talk about contents and activities, these contents and activities could be generated by the system as in augmented uh, content or augmented activities. These can be curated by the instructor. In any, any way, they have to be validated, but there's a curation also aspect to it. So the idea for this system is to reduce the mind-numbing task, to make the instructor more efficient, concentrating on more creative tasks, so to lessen mental fatigue and boredom. We do not want to reduce the critical role of the instructor or expert in the field. So instead, we would like to make him more potent in control of uh, the, uh, and, and with the help of an intelligent assistant. Of course, the instructor can delegate some of this validation, curation to the teaching assistants. It's up to, it would be up to the instructors. Uh, example of interactions would be how many times a specific topic has been reviewed by a particular student with full format, such as format, 
of the uh, full detail story, uh, such as format and level of interaction. And based on the interaction between the TA and the students and the system and the students, the system would prepare various digest trends for instructors using data analytics, of course, students, TAs, and the institution. Well, the instructor will be fully aware of these interaction. So again, uh, this is an assistant uh, to, the, uh, to the instructor where the human decision making is always above the machine. Over to Banafshe for her insights on validation curation. Thank you. Very well said. So just, uh, just adding a very small uh, point that this is an important social and ethical, there is uh, an important um, social and ethical objective with this function that the system does not reduce the role of the instructors and it recognize qualitative expert human judgment alongside insights we obtained from data. And also there, this is a very important function that marks the first important distinction uh, with the most general and commercial algorithmic recommendation systems that we know such as Facebook, TikTok and Instagram. In Facebook, for example, we are only the consumer of recommendations. We think that it should not be the case for an adaptive teaching and learning system in higher education. Uh, if you can go to function. Yes, so here we on Zoom each time. I will on Zoom for you to see that this is going to be populated. So we are function one and let's move to function two and uh, function two over to you, Banafshi. Yeah, thanks so much. So the second uh, function that we expect uh, from adaptive teaching and learning systems is a pre-assessment function. So the objective of this function is to identify previous student knowledge and skills, to identify student strengths and weaknesses, to identify learning needs and preferences or interests of each student to help creating personalized learning pathway. The, uh, the instructor determine, uh, determines and sets the topics and their sequences. I turn over to Edmond for sharing a quick example about this function. Yes, thank you, Banafshe. It's just, uh, imagine we are in a math class and to make it super simple, uh, the assess prerequisite is a two-digit multiplication, which means that students should need to how, should need to know how to multiply two-digit numbers in order to learn in the class, which can be another class. Uh, so, uh, well, there are prompts that ask the student if he or she prefers textual or diagram, figure, av avatar, audio, what color, etc. And uh, from here on, the system would use student declared preferences, which can change at any time based on students' indication. Now, the step would be perhaps give a quiz like one digit multiplication, and then the student would be to would answer. And then based on this answer, there will be a feedback. If the answer is correct, the system would bring, so we move on from topic one, level one to topic one, level two. So we would we will move on to the uh, next level, which is two digit multiplication. And if it is not correct, if the student didn't get it correctly, we have the possibility of having remediation. So personalized feedback and remediation. So what is going to happen in this feedback is that we're going to exp we are, the system is going to explain to the student why the answer is wrong, for example, by showing the multiplication table, and we'll repeat the quiz with variations, variation of context, variation of diagrams, variation of colors, sounds, you name it. And if uh, this is going to be repeated for a certain number of times, say five times, and if after five times uh, the student can't make it, then the system would advise the student to get in touch with the teaching assistant or the instructor. And if everything is okay, well, uh, next uh, level would be uh, topic one, which is still the multiplication, level two, two-digit multiplication. So uh, this is how this is going to work. Thank you. So just to add a very small uh, uh, comments that on the social and ethical sites for the pre-assessment functions, we would like, for example, to include also some EDI questions to uh, ask to 
the students such as what do you like to do in this course what communities what languages do you like to bring to this classroom uh, so uh, here again we would like to see the very important role of validation curation function so over to you Edmund. excellent so we have seen function one and function two let's move on to function three and that function three is uh, a heavy function. Actually, this function, uh, both uh, Banafshi and I will love it because this is the core of the system. Uh, this is a personalized tutoring with an objective to use a personalized pathway supplemented by peer collaboration, friendly competition for each student to maximize engagement, empower students and encourage constructive human social interaction. So as this is the core function, I'm going to ask you to be a bit patient. It's going to be a bit longer than the previous function and the next functions. So first of all, we use multiple source of data. Obviously, we have the course learning outcomes, as you see here, to design this uh, tutoring, so uh, formative assessments. But we are going to use the input from other functions, so pre-assessment and learning preferences. We saw it, student voice, student progress monitor, the previous formative assessments that have been done and even summative assessments. So all of these data is going to be fed into that engine of personalized tutoring, who's going to design using the contents and the activities, of course, that are validated, curated, prepared by the instructor and using personalized feedback, marking and remediation is going to patiently work all over the same topic until the students get it. So we have three aspects, three main aspects. One, personalization. The students are going to engage with the content through activities at their own pace, using their own individual preferences, and they get feedback, real-time feedback. That's the second aspect, which will be personalized, which will identify misconceptions, which will clarify the muddy points. And this in this feedback, the system will have to indicate the starting points on how to address the uh, shortcomings, the gaps. For example, that could be suggesting resources, pinpointing to and showing exact relevant reference. So that's the page number, that's the uh, minute number in a video replay of a previous exercise, just as an example. So that was the second aspect. The third aspect is remediation. So remediation aims at providing multiple opportunities using various formats and contexts for students to retry until they feel comfortable with the topic, until they master the topic. So this approach provides a completely safe environment for the student and personalized. Of course, we have also, the, uh, uh, we are asking for uh, using reinforced learning with the possibility of badges to kind of enforce or encourage friendly competition among peers through gamification where uh, the traffic could be a simple badge. So in short, the advantage would be uh, that we, uh, we will have students that will fully feel confident with each set of knowledge, uh, skills and aptitudes, and they are ready for the next topic and assessment. So uh, let me share quick an example with you uh, in order to stay away always from exact sciences. Uh, that's a very quick example from uh, a formative assessment, imaginary formative assessments done in group uh, that uh, the students are supposed to do some research and identify the main six root factors that contributed to the French Revolution in 1789. Well, uh, obviously here what we are uh, trying to do is uh, to encourage students to work together. So that's the collaborative aspect. Then the system would analyze the essay. And if the group of students misses a factor or two of the explanation that comes, the explanation does not fit well, it's not well designed, the system will review, reformulate, and offer guidance that this is what needs to be done. And uh, the students will be able to repeat this exercise until they get it correctly. Advantage is 
before passing over to Bashe, is that we believe that the combination of formative assessments plus feedback plus remediation discourages academic misconduct. Instead, we simply propose the, to the student, repeat till you feel ready for the real exam. So each time using a new representation, personalized representation formats of the material that would be fully adapted to the student's preferences. Over to you, Banafshe. Yeah, thank you so much. So just on social and ethical aspects of this uh, part, as Edmund mentioned, the expectation for this function is very complex and uh, cover various aspects. There are especially many important technical, social, ethical questions about data selections, data analysis, student agency, knowledge model, pedagogy model, and learner model, which we will not address today. I enumerate just some of our expectations here and we'll come back on them uh, with more details in the second and third uh, presentations. So on the social side, for example, we would like to see a strong student partnership co-creation of knowledge enhanced by personalized tutoring function. We would like that the students comment on the usefulness of the feedbacks. So there will be a healthy uh, two-way communication. A student can see a report on why this pathway has been presented to them. Uh, another function, uh, which is a student progress, we'll talk more about um, this, uh, this report. And we want that students can request the modification of pathway. Uh, inclusion side, uh, we want that the system pay attention to diversity. The resources are culturally accurate, current, and free of bias. On the differentiation part, the resource differentiate inst instructions for a diverse population of learners, for example, English or French as a second or third language learner for a student with uh, disability, etc. Etc. So I turn over to Edmo for the Thank you. Four. Thank you, Benafshi. So we have seen so far three functions, and let's move on to function number four, which is the summative assessment. Here, actually, I'm going to be extremely short because basically we are uh, uh, very close to personalized tutoring here. The objective is to use a personalized approach to assessments so that these assessments are truly reflective of a student's level of learning of the course learning outcome, so the mastery of course learning outcome, uh, as opposed to the difficulty of the student to answering questions because of their learning preferences. So you see now is UDL principles in full operation. So the same concepts as for the personalized tutoring function do apply with a single difference, there is no remediation. There is real-time feedback and we would like to brag a bit about this feature the reason being is that usually when students sit for an exam it takes a long time for them to get this feedback but in this case they they get real-time feedback so we offer the feedback the system offers the feedback just in time when the memory of the exam is still fresh and this could be used for building knowledge and solidifying this knowledge in the mind of the students uh now we can move on to the next function so we are here over to banafshe for function number five yeah thank you so much so the fifth function that we expect from an adaptive teaching and learning system is student progress monitor the objective of this function is to give a real-time objective and accurate picture of the progress of each student and groups of students so Information obtained from this function fits an instructor dashboard, fits a student dashboard, and fits the TA dashboard. And as I mentioned before, in personalized tutoring function, instructors and students can see a report on why and how the pathway has been uh, presented to them, or why and how the result has been uh, produced. Uh, and then it's not again like, like Facebook where the user doesn't know why this news feed was presented to them. Um, all the information are used, for example, for identify low, medium, or high level at risk students, provide insight and recommendations, produce weekly briefing, and inform need for reinforcement learning topics and skills that are still not masters by uh, students. I turn over to Edmond for giving some 
as he called on social expectation? Or? Thank you, Benafshe. Uh, here we expect that all rules and regulations on privacy and security have been complied with, yes, at all stages of data selection, recording, analysis, and storage. That's the first idea. The challenge is that these definitions are not yet available, so we need to define these rules and regulations for such systems. So uh, keep, uh, we will keep you posted on that. Ideally, we would like also to have full visibility of the algorithms and explainability as to the insights that they are offered to the system. So now those of you who know deep learning, uh, most of you neural networks and so on, you know it's an extremely challenging task, but we are hopeful uh, that the uh, technology and the algorithm designers will be able to provide us with some kind of guidance as why, as Banafshi mentioned just now, why these insights are offered. We would like also to have some degree of control over the algorithms. Is it possible to have some kind of customization of the engine? So it's not a black, black box, it's more a gray box. So we have some control. So this is our wish list. Anyway, students should always have full access to the history of their choices and the explanation of why such and such a pathway has been proposed to them. Students should be able to intervene and modify the proposed pathways so they are in full control of their learning. All of these, of course, again, under the validation and curation uh, powers that is given are given to the ultimate class authority, which is the instructor. We are going to meet ethical challenges, so more on that, uh, as Manafshir mentioned in the second presentation, the effect of prediction of students more on students' morale, so uh, we, we speak about prediction of the learning, etc. Let's leave all of that for the next meeting. Over to Banafshe for the next function. So let me move forward, Banafshe. Give me one second. So we're on Zoom here. We're function five, function six, and Zoom function six. Over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Edmond. So um, the function six uh, is called a student's voice. Objective of a student's voice is that by scanning perceptions of students uh, uh, on instructional pedagogy, for example, or on the course, it offers an avenue for students to express themselves. It helps also, it also helps instructors to explore opinions and emotions so that they can get the pulse of the class as a whole and uh, each student individually and do the necessary adjustments of the course. Uh, similar to the previous function, which was a student progress, the information gathered in student voice function feeds the instructor dashboard, student dashboard, and dashboard for TI. And these are a configurable dashboard uh, in our expectation by, by, by stakeholders. And some of a concrete task, could be social media tracking in order to explore perceived by students and re real efficiency of the systems. Could be a help, uh, could, could help instructors and TAs to do forum moderations, create digest, draft responses, schedule office hours, and do the follow up. And um, also, um, maybe one interesting uh, functions that could be analyze group dynamics and intervene early. So I hand over to Edmund for giving an example about this last uh, function. And thank you. Uh, this example is close to my heart because I have lived this example many, many times when it, during the 20 plus years of uh, teaching experience that I had at universities. Imagine a group assignment that you give to your students. The group is composed of three students to make things simple. And one of the students is perceived by the two others as less responsible. In other words, they are thinking that this third student is taking a free ride. As a result, there is some friction. The group dynamics is not correct. Uh, and the other two students expect the instructor to intervene, but he doesn't have the information. The two students don't want to create more stress by confronting directly the third students. Nobody desires to report directly, despite the fact that, well, they know about the procedures, the policies, the contract, they have signed everything, they have been trained, but there is this human attached to it. So what's the problem? The problem is that if the situation is left unattended, the issue may lead to poor performance of the students and mental health issues for those, even the 
teacher assistants, uh, teaching assistants, and probably affect the instructor as well in the long term. So what's the solution? The solution would be for the system to monitor the content and number of exchanges, the emotional analysis of the students. So this is why uh, these ethical guardrails are super important. Uh, by detecting some unease in these exchanges, uh, for example, late or no reply from team members, uh, use of neutral or even uh, negative language uh, as, opposed to oppo uh, as opposed to positive encouragement. Uh, so there is on some unease that is detected by the system. So the system can offer help now. Heads up to student first, teaching assistant next, and the instructor offering suggestions as where the root of the problem might be. Perhaps this issue is the unbalance of the uh, load among the student, perhaps there is a problem in the learning or the expectations are not set right. Uh, reminding them uh, about the virtues of uh, honesty, explaining why they have to respect these, etc., and advice as to speak to the teaching assistant, to the instructor, and especially ways of saying this, especially true for international students who change their cultural environment. And sometimes for an international student, it's not good to say bad things about some, someone, and, uh, and even if this is true. So the ways of saying this and to tell them that this is okay. Uh, finally, a digest of the situation to the instructor would be uh, extremely useful and scheduling an office meeting for the students to meet with the instructor if it is ne needed and the problem has not been resolved. Over to Banafshi for ethical aspects. Yeah, for social and ethical aspects, I will be very quick. It is very important that dashboards for students' voices based on human-centered approach in including explainable reasoning for each configurable criterion. Very important that this function respects the privacy of others and honor confidentiality. And very important that the function contributes to students' well-being. And uh, yeah, that's it. I turn over to Edmond for- Okay, so we are function Cs. I see the time is flying, Banafshe, so we're going to move quickly towards the two remaining function. So one important function, uh, and uh, this function has been reminded to us uh, from one of our excellent colleagues who has uh, hinted us to the management of the TA. Before that, the TA management was a sub-function. Now it's a function on its own. And here we would like to offer help uh, so help with TA screening, where we could talk about interviewing, academic level assessment, preference assessment, and offering feedback, but especially TA personalized coaching uh, regarding the content that needs to be worked out with uh, each, uh, uh, each week with the students, what exercises, what labs, where are the muddy points for the students as detected by the system, communicate this, import, this information, the pedagogy aspects, uh, so for example, do not share the response directly, but guide students to discover the solution. And this is perhaps one way of doing it. So the system is giving hints uh, to encourage uh, curiosity and exploration. And uh, one other thing is to reformulate the feedback that the students are giving or sharing with the system reformulate them in such a way not to frustrate the teaching assistant, but give him motivation as to do all of that. And of course, the TA dashboard to be able to track uh, the progress. And at each, step, at each step, there is ample feedback that is given by the system. Remember all this feedback, all the interactions are uh, moderated, curated, validated by the instructor. So extremely important uh, function. And with this, I can move to the last function. The last function is a super uh, obvious function. It's the linkage that this, uh, the system, any system should have with the learning management system active in the, uh, the university. So we're talking here to ensure alignment. I'm not going to go one by one through the boxes. The idea is to ensure alignment between the lesson plan, the syllabus of this course, with the other elements of the course. So you need to have access to other course plans, but the system will take care and make sure that this alignment does exist. And if a misalignment is detected, the fact is reported to the instructor who would uh, review the case. Uh, 
the group administration, lastly, uh, is the uh, to uh, manage the formation of groups, which is a time-consuming task. You remember, we would like to offload these tasks. So any uh, the time-consuming task is offloaded. Admin admin task is offloaded to the uh, system. Okay, so. And this is uh, the conclusion of our uh, kind of uh, functions. We have eight functions, and uh, with this, we are re we reached feedback time. And I hope that you will be one of these three images, and not this one on the lower right uh, corner here right now about our presentation. By the way, this image has been AI generated by the platform that we are using. So that's to say also that there's a risk here if uh, the AI system creates an image like so and uh, shows it to the student, the student will be demotivated. So we, we hope that you all look like these uh, three on the left hand side. Thank you so much. If you can uh, please uh, uh, share the link uh, to WooClub for the feedback activity, I would be thankful. Um, uh, so we created um, a feedback activity. Please just go, uh, you can just click on the link or you can go to wooclub.com and enter the event code in the top band, uh, which is uh, D-U-N-U-D-C. And uh, I think that you can just do, now you can see the first um, activity, first questions. Please rate the importance of each uh, of the eight functions presented to you. Uh, we can just give maybe one minute, uh, please. And when you are done, we go to the second question. Lots of uh, great information. Thank you, Ben O'Shea and Edna. I would also just, I would just invite anyone, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to post them now in the Q&A and we'll get to those in a few minutes. Uh, in the last little bit that we have left, we may run out of room for a lot of questions, but uh, Edmund and Ben O'Shea have graciously offered to hang back for a couple minutes after the end of the webinar if you have any burning questions you'd like to to chat about uh, alternatively if you don't get to your question today and you got to run um i will be emailing out information and content that has been shared here today to everyone who registered and i'll invite anyone if you have questions you'd like to pose to edmonton edmund and banishe you can email them to me and we'll get some answers for you so we have lots of ways to to engage and hopefully answer uh your questions but please feel free to put them in the uh in the chat or alternatively uh, I would offer you to raise your hand now if you'd like as well yeah, sure. and we can thank you Don um, thank you so much I'm not sure if um, everyone uh, had the chance to do the first question so I can go to the second question yeah or I'm waiting a little bit I can go can I go? I think so yeah okay so I go to the uh, second question what function do you think need to be added or what function is missing in our imaginary adaptive system? So here the idea is um, to seek your feedback about any function that you think at this level, this is a high level uh, function design, conceptual design that we are thinking. Uh, so if we have missed any function that you think, or any other uh, comments that you may have for us would be most welcome. I'm, I'm curious, sure if, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, do you, have, do you have access to the second question? Is it okay? Yes, I can see it. And okay. actually I entered something. Okay, good. Um, I was just going to ask uh, while folks are answering the question, and I know at the outset uh, you had mentioned uh, curation and content curation and having. So, I, do you see any barriers as it stands now in post secondary in general in terms of getting the amount of content as well as the variety of content uh, kind of at the finger at the disposal of any individual instructor and having enough to? 
really take full advantage of what really AI is going to be able to do for us as it begins to get more and more sophisticated? Because I know in my experience in instructing, you know, I, I create a curriculum, but it's very linear. It's very much aimed at the middle. And I'm always time pressed to, to even get that done. Um, do you see any barriers or maybe some best practices that institutions and instructors should be looking ahead at in order to take full advantage of what the technology is going to be able to do as we move forward? Uh, can I? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, then I, um, I, I think a lot about that because we, we there is the time constraints for instructors and uh, for adaptive learning teaching. I think that we need uh, lots of content. I think one of the one of the solution could be to co-create a class. So maybe the collaboration between two or three instructors who are working on a on a course on a micro program. I don't know micro, and so they can collaborate for creating content uh, for that. Or maybe that will be a shared class for more than one instructor. I don't know. If I answer to your question. Um, no, you, yes, definitely. So I think it, you're right. It's, it's sharing of the contents. It's sharing on the collaboration. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure. I'm not 100. I mean, I guess it's happening some places. I don't know. Is it happening ubiquitously across the sector? And is there enough of it going on? Uh, or should it be something we should be looking at more and more, I think? Yeah. Uh, I think that we are not yet there because we have to also improve also the, the digital cultures at the universities and also maybe thinking more about big questions about technology, about knowledge creation, etc. But absolutely, I see like you, lots of advantages in, in adaptive learning, but I'm not sure if we are yet there. So maybe we have to rethink different aspects. If I may add something, actually, Banafshe, is that, uh, well, uh, the, the, the way we have uh, conceived these functions is for the content to, uh, an initial content to be ready and the assessments to be ready by what does exist. So imagine the, a course is being offered and then all of this is uh, uploaded into the system and what would happen is that the system, the augmented AI uh, system would go and look at, let's say, uh, open resources, other courses, etc., and would try to uh, reformat all of this information to enrich the content. So uh, that's, that's the way we look at it. But the main challenge that I see right now is before that stage. The, the, the main challenge that I see right now is that uh, seemingly uh, we as academic institutions are a bit uh, kind of confused, if I may say, or not very clear about what are the directions to be taken. And we have been led so far by technology. So it was the product that was introduced to us and we're kind of reactive. What we propose here is to be more proactive and kind of give guidance to these excellent developers, companies in the field to uh, design systems that would be aligned with the needs of the students and the instructors and the academic institutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to both of you for that great answer. Um, so just uh, again, if anyone has questions I'd like to chat about at the end, uh, please hang back. But uh, that really just concludes our time that we have here today. I'd like to thank Van of Shea and Edmonton, Edmund, uh, for uh, sharing their, their work here today. I warned you I would get tongue-tied, and I, I did. Uh, so, but uh, <laughs> thank you to you, uh, our audience, for uh, joining us here today. And uh, thank you to the eCampus Ontario comms team for uh, helping get all this webinar set up. Uh, we couldn't do it without you folks. Uh, today was only part one of our webinar series. So on May 18th, we are gonna have part two and we're gonna be examining uh, what knowledge, pedagogy and learner models do we expect adaptive teaching and learning systems to implement. So if you've not already done so, please feel free to register for this event uh, at the link now being posted in our chat. Uh, the recordings from today and our previous webinars that we've done in adaptive learning will be on our adaptive learning uh, webpage. Uh, you can access our webpage by the QR screen or QR code on the left of your screen or by clicking on the link that is being posted in the chat. 
I'd also invite you to explore eCampus Ontario's various programs and services that are supporting post-secondary education in Ontario. A particular note is our newly launched webpage on digital transformation, which can be accessed via the link uh, on the right-hand side of your screen or via the link being posted in the chat. Uh, here you can explore eCampus Ontario supports that are helping post-secondary institutions unlock the potential of their digital learning priorities through open education resources, professional development, such as our Leadership for Digital Transformation micro-credential, and our soon-to-launch Digital Transformation Guides. Please check these resources out and register your interest. So all the links from today, the recording from today's presentation, the slides will all be sent out and emailed to all registrants, and I invite anyone to ask Ask any questions in those emails, send them back, and I will definitely get them to Banishe and Edmund for, uh, for answering as well. But thank you all very much and uh, for attending and have a great day. Thank you, Don, and thank you, eCampus Ontario, for giving us this opportunity. And thank you, Banafshe, for your excellent presentation. Thank you so much.